today I was thinking we could start with a little quiz, kind of see where you are with patents, and then um, go from there. So one second, I'm gonna pull this up and share it with you. Hit present. All right, so yeah, today we'll start with this and um, let me drop this down to the bottom. I'll give you a little bit more time. All right, so the issue here is you've got an inventor. Uh, somebody named Steve invents this robot. It goes around the country tracking crooked accountants. I don't know how this works, but stay with me here. Uh, 21 years after Steve registered the patent, another company starts selling the exact same robot. robot. So sales of the identical robots would be, and go ahead, A, B, C, or D. So you've got about a minute here. Uh, give that a shot and then we'll start talking about patents. All right, five seconds. And cool. All right, three of you didn't even do it. That's all right. Um, but let's let's go ahead and pull this up. So we've got. Um, all right. So, okay, interesting. Uh, the winner here is going to be B, at least the most popular one, I should say. Any of the experts want to like tell us what the right answer is? You're like this this is too narrow of a win here i'm not going to go with it um, well i'm not an expert today but i know it was b because i know for a fact that um for the reading it says uh patents are only you can only have a patent for 20 years and then you have to reapply for it so that kind of gave it away after the 20 21st yeah year. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so Taylor's got it here. Um, after twenty years, your patent expires, meaning you don't, you don't have a patent anymore. And and so, yeah, that that's exactly right. Uh, uh, question. Yeah. Is this why Disney keeps making those live action remakes after all these years? <laughs> all right. So we'll talk about Disney quite a bit this week. Um, but that's not a patent issue. That's going to be one of their copyright issues. So. Uh, it's it's close, and, and there's a reason that Disney keeps doing some funny stuff. But it doesn't have to do with this. So, so yeah, hang on to that thought, because we'll, we'll definitely get there. Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, it's not a violation of the patent, because the patent only lasts 20 years anyway, so that's why A would knock A off. An example of the merchant's perfect tender rule. Somebody's just playing with me by picking that one. That's just... <laughs> not even close. Uh, and then patent infringement, if Steve can show that his patent was novel and useful, presumably, but only if it was during that 20 years that the patent was actually active. So uh, yeah, good. Good job. Eight of you got it right. So the eight of you, you can just check out. You probably don't even need this lecture. Um, I'm kidding. We'll go over some other things as well here. So uh, let's pull up the slides for today present here and yeah we'll just kind of dive in to patents now patents are just one of the the various uh, subject matter involved with intellectual property and uh, but it's one it, it's an important one and I like to start with it um, just because it, it's it's in, to, in some ways it's easier at least in the way that we'll be discussing it in this class um, trademarks and copyrights can have some complexity within the, the area of business law and patents definitely can, 
but we're going to keep this relatively simple. Again, like many of the classes, many of the chapters that you read, I, I, I give you a chapter, and especially this one was quite short. You were probably very happy when you woke up this morning to read patent law and saw that it was only this big until you saw that I sent you to that really boring video on the USPTO website. Deal with it. All right, so, um, but patents, at least in, in the way that we'll study it, can be fairly simple. It, and, and, and we'll go through that today. So first off, um, on the exam, uh, this was actually the highest average I think that you've had. So it was an 84% was the class average, I should say. Um, there were four people that got 100%, so that hurts. Um, but uh, th there were a couple of you that got fairly low scores too. So again, if you're one of those people, I think it's important that you make an appointment with the tutor. Olivia is happy to talk to you and, and get you back on track. All right, um, again, motion to dismiss or the appeal, that'll be due this upcoming Saturday. I am, I should tell you this, I'm gonna give you a little break. So you've done two weeks in a row where you've only had exams spaced two weeks apart. So the sub, you had two weeks to basically get ready for the exam. Uh, I'll give you three now. So in the next three weeks, we're gonna talk about intellectual property and then kind of move in um, let's see, this will be exam four. So we'll get into uh, employment law, yep. harassment, discrimination. Um, and I, I think that this next unit, this is probably my favorite. So uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of interesting uh, discussions here in class. Okay, so let's see. This slide, anyway, um, Okay, so, so I, have to, I, I have to do it. I, I talked up suits at the beginning of the semester and um, you know, good for me. Suits is overall, I think, a fairly accurate depiction of corporate law life. I've told you that before, but man, they really, really, really screwed up patents. And so anyway, this, this link that I've got here, you can watch it another time, but there's an episode where uh, Donna, and those of you that have seen the show know what I'm talking about. Donna uh, works with Ben, who is the IT guy at the law firm, and they come up with a device, basically Alexa, but they're gonna call it the Donna. And it's it's a, whatever, whatever Alexa is, that's what the Donna is, and it talks back to you during the day, and anyway, kind of fun. But when they go to file the patent, it gets denied because in the clip that, 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 that I show normally in class, um, they find out that a competitor's product overlaps with theirs, and they're very vague as to what that even means, by like 34%. And anyway, Donna takes it to Lewis Litt, who's like, that's above the threshold. We need to get it below 32.5% or whatever he says. And I'm watching this episode with my daughter who wants to go to law school, and I'm like, I like almost spit out my Cheerios or what I'm like, what are they talking about? That there's no percentage of overlap. And I don't even know what they're talking about with over like the code overlaps 34%. Anyway, it was this bizarre thing that, that just drove me nuts. Like, like we need to get that below 32%. <laughs> like, there's no such thing, right? Like there, there's patents and there's patent infringement. And what they did in that episode I think is very typical for what a lot of people here growing up, like many of you probably heard in high school, that it's not copyright infringement if, if you only copy three pages out of the book or, or something bizarre like that. Like some of you are nodding your heads like, yeah, my English teacher told me that. Your English teacher was a liar, all right? And this, this makes me so mad that I'm, I'm gonna have to calm myself down right now. All right, so. Okay, that there aren't any percentages, there's just infringement. Now to infringe, it has to be substantial infringement. And this is where, again, maybe your high school English teacher, a lot of you accountants in the room are, are like, that, that doesn't make sense. Like I need a number, I need a percentage, I need something. And, and I'm not gonna give it to you because the law doesn't give it to you either. It, it just has to be substantial overlap. And so, 
Um, and, and with patents, again, if, if you use something that has been patented already, that's called patent infringement. And um, that's just how it is. So uh, where we work out the details is it's, um, it's in opinion letters, it's in court with, with um, juries that decide whether or not something was substantial infringement. But again, if on the exam you see something like, you know, John is, is concerned about the infringement, but he's happy that it's only 14% infringement or something, good gracious, that's not the right answer. So don't ever pick that. Um, all right, so anyway, okay, my rant's over. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I'm just checking out the... Um, Okay, so yeah, if so, yeah, you can if you got a ninety six, you can appeal, but just do a motion to dismiss. That's an easier four points. So, all right, um, all right, I'll go back to this. So, on your slide right now, I wanted to use something that that you recognize, something that is part of your life. So, here it is, ramen. All right, this is basically what I lived off of to get through undergrad. This and, well, that's a story for another day, but a lot of ramen noodles uh, to get through undergrad. Now, this little packet of ramen noodle, what, what does this cost nowadays? Is this like 25 cents still? Yeah, just about. Okay. So, yeah, um, not a whole lot of price inflation going on with ramen since I was uh, an undergrad. Was that 10, 15 years ago? I think it, it cost us a quarter as well. So when you buy your ramen noodles, again, it's, it's this packet right here is probably worth 25 cents. And yet the value of the intellectual property contained in this image right here is worth substantially more than that. So uh, I want you to look at this and kind of give me an over, tell me what is the intellectual property that you see? Now this could be things that are patented, copyright, trademarks, trade secrets, just any of these things, and I understand that you haven't read all those other chapters about the other forms of intellectual property, but you can still guess a lot of these things. So go ahead, you can use your microphone and just tell me some the of the- logo, definitely, definitely the logo and the name of the brand. Yeah, so- But not something like ramen noodle soup or roast chicken flavor or something like that. Definitely not those two. Yeah, these kind of generic identifiers like ramen noodle soup or roast chicken flavor. You could imagine the uproar if, if you got the intellectual property and you're the only person that can say roast chicken flavor. That doesn't make any sense at all. Like, like, like anyway, the, there's lots of roast chicken flavors out there. Like, what, what would Costco do if they could tell that their rotisserie chicken had a roast chicken flavor, right? So, so but, but again, you're right. So the Maruchin, the, the brand here, um, and I think that's how you pronounce it, Maruchin. Yeah, Maruchan. Maruchan. All right, so there we go. Um, and this little logo of the little smiling kid, that's right. Um, and then I think you said the image, right? Is, is, oh, is I said the logo of the smiling face. I'm not sure about the chicken. Like, this looks like something that uh, you could uh, search up on something like Microsoft Word and then put it on there. <laughs> yeah, so, so the little, um, what did we used to call these things in the 90s? Um, Clip the bar? art? Clip art, that's it. Yeah, that's what it looks like. So I'm not even sure if that is considered copyright. All right. So, yeah, we've. Uh, I'll just tell you, it is. Like, if, if you created that, if you drew that, that you're going to get the copyright to that. And same with this kind of stock image. It's probably a Getty image of chicken with noodles or something. And anyway, it's got all these fresh vegetables that and chicken that you're not eating with the ramen. I know you. You're just, all of you are just, eating the 25 cent stuff with the weird chemicals that you put in and somehow that adds flavor and we'll probably all get cancer someday. And yet, yeah, yeah, you're right. So th those are some of the things that you can see. What, what else, like, like other items of intellectual property involved here? Would, would the noodles themselves be able to be patented? I remember reading somewhere about how like the guy who invented quick ramen came up with a different structure for noodles that allowed them to be dehydrated and rehydrated. 
Yeah. So, so yeah, you, you, you're hitting on a couple of things here. Um, one is the formula for the noodles. If, if, if you come up with some way to do the noodle, like create the noodles that is novel and useful, like we'll get to that in a second, but allows it to be woven or whatever it is and dried and then rehydrated or whatever that that's a possibility also. And, and this kind of brings up the, that other idea, that machine that weaves the noodles together. Definitely like, like that machine probably was at one time patented. Um, and any improvements on that machine could later be patented as well. So, so yeah, you, you, you've got a lot of that as well. Anything else that anybody saw? With the process of making the noodles, because I know that they have to be like flash frozen in order to maintain the way that they are, um, or like flash dried, it's, it's a process where they're uh, very quickly processed the way that they are. That's That process, can that be patented as well? Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. So that process or the machine at least that, that does it, could definitely be patented. Um, now, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hold on saying something else until a little bit later. Um, but yeah, everything that you guys have said so far is right. Uh, you've got some copyright issues beyond just the images, kind of the, the, the instructions on the back, kind of these, these, maybe the history about the company, whatever it is that you see on that back flap beyond like the ingredient list a lot of those things are gonna be copyrighted as well. So, or have copyright protection. So, so yeah, good, good job. I think the, you hit a lot of the main things that, um, that I was gonna talk about anyway. So we're, we're good with that. Now, this one right here, this image, I, I always love showing this to my students um, because we've had one president in the history of the United States that had a patent. Anybody want to guess before looking it up? Uh, I'm going to go with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's smart. Darn it, his name is on the image, but, <laughs> but, but you're right. So Abraham Lincoln, like even if you didn't see it, you'd probably be like, it, it would have to be Abraham Lincoln because it was. Anyway, uh, Abraham Lincoln grew up in Illinois, was from Illinois, I should say, and uh, had to deal with a lot of these canals that shipped goods. This was pre highways and, and before the trains could get everywhere, a lot of goods were shipped around the country using canals. And this right here is a canal boat, kind of this bottom right image is like, if you were looking at the canal boat coming towards you, of course, the big image is the, the long version, but you'll notice kind of when you're looking at it straight on, you've got these, um, I, I want to call them crutches that come down the side of the boat. And that's essentially what these are. So when, when the water was running low, sometime the, sometimes these canal barges would kind of run up into a sandbar or something and get stuck. And they'd have to either wait until the water rose again or something else, get it out. It, it was just causing a lot of trouble. So Abraham Lincoln came up with this idea that basically down the side of the ship, the, you could lower these arms that would go to the sandbar and kind of lift the boat up and move it a little bit until you got to the other side of the sandbar, and then you could continue on your journey down the canal. Uh, never really caught on, like no, nobody really did this. It, you, you could damage the bottom of the boat as you were kind of lifting it and dropping it onto the sandbar. So again, not the most useful patent, but it was useful enough to get around the requirements of a patent. And so again, President Lincoln had a patent and I looked it up. He got it in uh, 1849 and he was 40 years old in 1849. So if you ever feel bad that you don't have a patent, just know it took like our most brilliant president 40 years to get a patent. So you're okay. And I'm still 39. So I'm all right too. I feel good about myself here. Um, all right. Uh, so again, the, like moving on to this slide, this is just kind of the basics of patents. And again, I'm, we could get very complicated, uh, but we're not, mostly because I never took that semester long patent class while I was in law school. So I just know the basics. So really, this is it. I mean, it's a, 
it, it's a it's a grant. It's basically a limited monopoly to you, the inventor of whatever it is that you've invented, your creation. We're going to let you have twenty years to make a profit off of that. Um, again, we, we the the philosophy behind this makes sense. If if we didn't do this and everybody could just copy your invention, well, what incentive are we giving you to create? a new way to weave that noodle or get to space or, or whatever it is. Uh, fidget spinners has an like, incredible, interesting patent story. Um, uh, like, and, and again, so dumb and yet patented, right? And, and so anyway, we, we've got these interesting um, kind of philosophical reasons behind allowing patents. But we don't want to la let it last too long. Like, like if, if we gave you the patent for 100 years, well then, man, that, that, that's just not a limited time. You're going to make too much money. It's going to stifle competition and eventually hurt the economy. So we kind of settled on this idea that 20 years was long enough. All right. Now, again, the, the second bullet point uh, involves those three requirements. It has to be novel meaning new, it can't be something that already exists, so it has to be novel, it has to be useful, and, and this one's interesting because how useful, well, a fidget spinner got patented, so I mean, how useful is that? Well, it's got a use, that, I, I think that's the way to look at it, like it's useful meaning it's got a use for somebody, Somebody would want to buy this thing. That, that's the very low bar, <laughs> okay? And then it can't be obvious. It, it can't be something that, yeah, it may be new, but it's only new because everybody already does it. Like it's such an integrated part of our lives that like my, 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 my five-year-old kid could have come up with that idea. Like, like it's that obvious. So those are the three requirements. Um, on the exam, the way that I test this is just simple. Like if, uh, if I say that somebody has been using this method for 20 years and everybody in this industry uses that method, well, that's going to tell you this probably isn't novel and you're going to write not patentable. Okay. Um, okay. And then the sub bullet point just says it includes artistic methods, works of art, certain business processes. That could get super complicated. Let's chill out and not even go down that path, okay? Um, although if you have questions, please let, let, let me know about it. But for our exam purposes, let's not worry about that yet. Um, except for, I will just say, with the business process, it's not like your company slogan is, it, that, that's just not a business process. But the example that I use in the book, I think, is the best one to, to think about there. Like Amazon's Buy Now. The, at the time, that was new. That was novel. That was useful. Um, not obvious. Again. And, and so they could get a patent for the Buy Now button. It was a process that allowed people to buy quickly without having to review their cart, review their credit card information, hit accept, you know, and, and for clicks later you finally bought your whatever from amazon so so that's what i'm talking about with business processes not the way that the business operates or something like that um like, like you, can't, you, you can't patent your hr office is what i'm saying uh, yeah i think i heard a question um yeah so a question with uh wd-40 don't they not have a patent so that way they don't have to disclose the ingredients of yeah. it yeah, so, so Tears is bringing up an incredible point here, and, and it's the reason Coca-Cola is the same way. Um, when Coca-Cola was invented in that drugstore in Atlanta, Georgia, um, the, the uh, original idea was like, let's get a patent for this, and that way nobody else can make Coca-Cola. Like, it'll just be us. And, and, and it sounds like it's the same. I, my recollection is it's the same with WD-40. And... But, but the attorney for, for this druggist, the, the drugstore owner in, in uh, whatever his name was in Atlanta, Georgia, like eventually the, the attorney said, hey, how about we don't get a patent? And, 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 and the reason was, like, like Tears has said, if we do that, sure, we get to sell it for 20 years and nobody else gets to sell it. But then 
we gave it to the public. And after 20 years, everybody has the rights to make Coca-Cola and market it. Now they can't use the same name, like they could sell it under the Coca-Cola trademark, but they would have the formula. And, 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 and yeah, same with WD-40. And so there are options to keep it out of a patent. And, and we're going to call that a trade secret. We'll, we'll talk about that next Monday. But just know that, that's, that, that, that that is an option and an alternative to patents is just don't ever put it out there, keep it secret, and call it a trade secret. And then it can last forever. All right, so yeah, awesome, awesome comment. Um, so this last bullet point, yeah. laws of nature, natural phenomena, abstract ideas, those aren't patentable. And yet, <clears throat> Monsanto is bought out by Bayer. They can take a soybean, genetically alter it so that it isn't susceptible or as susceptible to droughts or certain insects. And because they change that genetic code, you can now patent it. But this, this idea originally started in the eight, or it was the 90s. Somebody mapped out the human genome and, and you know, the DNA sequence, you like go back to those classes that, that you've had. And um, yeah, so, and then they went to patent it and they said, you know, here it is, the human genome. And the USPTO and eventually the courts that got this were like, you want to patent the code to be human? <laughs> and anyway, that wasn't going to fly because that's just the naturally, um, um, the, a natural phenomenon. That, that's a law of nature. That's the genetic code of what makes humans human. We're not going to let you patent that because you could see the absurdity. Like, what, what are you going to do? Not allow people to be human or something? That's not going to work. But if we're working with genetically modified seeds, that's okay because you created something new. Um, so yeah, any questions on that? Okay, cool. I just had a question on the time period of the patent. Like yeah, the twenty I, years. Uh huh. Um, so you said that they didn't go with patenting their Coca-Cola product because in 20 years they're going to have to reveal that and everyone could have it. Yeah. Um, so did they not have the option to just continue to renew their patent or is that a more difficult process than I'm thinking? That's right. You don't renew your patent. After 20 years, it expires. Now, okay, so you get it for 20 years and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then it's public and then anybody can use it. So, okay. so many things have done that have gone through this process <clears> like aspirin, uh, that's why there's so many generic versions of aspirin. If you go to Walgreens or actually most medications now that there's a generic version that only exists because it's been 20 years since the original, you know, like, like, like histamine blocker, like, like Claritin D or whatever those allergy medications are, they expire. And so then you'll get like the target brand or the Walmart brand or whatever. They'll just take the, basically the patent, the formula, and make it themselves. Yeah, and, and, and we like that. We, we think that's important because, you know, we gave them 20 years and we figure that's enough. You made your money. Move over, competition. All right. Okay. So, Brother Hales, where do recipes fit in? Are, are they patentable or are they another form of intellectual property? Yeah, so, so a formula like the Coke recipe could absolutely be patented. Um, but, but the, the main one there is you've got to deal with like, is it novel? Like, is it new or, or does this recipe like, like, let's go with any, the, an example that we used earlier in the class, like my mom's secret clam chowder recipe. Is that just a variation of something that already exists? Like, is it really new? That's, that's the question that you got to get over. And is it, is it known like, like novel? Do other people know about it? Um, yeah, Th that's the problem with most recipes is that you, you can get, you can have it thought on those grounds. Yeah. So brother Hells, would most of those recipes just fall underneath trade secrets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what most people decide to do is just, just keep it a trade secret. Um, and actually we haven't talked about my mom's clam chowder recipe. We're going to talk about that when we get to trade secrets. 
be, because Tears is absolutely right. If, if you don't patent it and you keep it secret, and there's a bunch of other requirements when we talk about trade secrets, if you do that, you keep it forever. Like Coke, they have this fictional thing called the, the Coke vault, and that's where they keep the, the recipe for Coke. Um, and, and if any of you have toured the, the Coke Museum in Atlanta, they'll even like open up a big fake vault. And anyway, it, it's all designed to like make you, and Disney does this too, but that has nothing to do with this. Um, but yeah, you can do that and you can keep it forever as long as you keep it secret. That's the key thing. So if, if, if it ever gets out because Coca-Cola negligently let it out or, um, uh, yeah, it's not a trade secret anymore. And then actually everybody could start making Coca-Cola. So uh, Coca-Cola spends a lot of time, money, effort, all of that to keep their actual recipe a secret. And, and, and I've had students that have worked for like bottling company, like soda bottling distributorships around here. And they're like, yeah, like we don't, we don't know what it is. We just get the syrup made and, and, and the syrup companies, they don't get to put it all together themselves. Like one, one air, like, like one chemical company or whatever makes half of the ingredients for the syrup and another company somewhere else makes the other half and then it's combined somewhere else. And then that finished product gets to the bottling company. Like it's crazy what they do to keep things a secret. So yeah, crazy stuff. Um, which brings us to searching patents and, and, and how do you do this? How do you create a patent? Well, uh, with this, I think probably the best way to do this is just to show you how it's done. So if we, if you just go over to uspto.gov, uh, this is the United States Patent and Trademark Office website, hence uspto.gov. And uh, we'll come back here when we talk about trademarks, but uh, if, let me zoom in here. If we come to patents, this is where you can search patent basics, how it, like, like the overview of everything. But the fun thing to do is search for patents. And I, I gave you a couple, um, no, I told you actually to go find a couple patents. So if we come down here, I'm just gonna do a quick search and I'll just pick a random company known as Tesla Motors. And let's see here. If I search for Tesla Motors, then you'll see a, a number of these. Um, method for synthesizing nickel cobalt aluminum electrodes, self-driving vehicle system and methods. Yeah, um, these are all things that Tesla is creating and uh, working on right now. This one is just a couple months old from April, uh, yeah. And this is a new way to prepare an electrode for use in rechargeable batteries. Thrilling, right? I always actually just go straight to images right up here. I just click on images and see what it looks like. Uh, whoops. Here we go. So this is the image that Tesla, like I can't even tell you, they probably spent a million dollars on this patent application. And this is the image that they submitted. Cool, it looks like my three-year-old drew it. Um, but they know what this means and the US Patent Office attorneys presumably know what this means. And, and so, yeah. But did any of you guys find anything cool that you wanna talk about when you were doing searches? No, not, not anything cool. All right, that's all right. Um, so, uh, let's jump back into the slides here. Cause I've got, well, actually I've got an interesting. Yeah, wait, so I also got a good question. Yeah. So let's say, um, an employee comes up with, uh, a, a new product or a process mm -hmm. who will own the rights of that, uh, patent. Is it the enterprise or the employee? Yeah. Good. Awesome question. Um, it's almost always the company. And, and the, the reason that that is, is uh, typically when, when you start at, let's say Tesla or SpaceX or GE or anywhere, 
uh, and you're an engineer or whatever, the employment contract itself will say, hey, by the way, anything that you create will be our intellectual property. Uh, and, and if I went back to that Tesla uh, patent from April, it'll say like the inventors were John Smith, um, you know, and, and it'll name like four or five people and then it'll say owned by Tesla. So, so the inventors are the workers, but Tesla is the one that owns it. Why? Because it hired those people and their job was to invent a better electrode for recharging a vehicle. That's, that, that, that's what's going on there. Not now, to mention uh, Tesla also provided the assets for them to come up with it to begin with. Yeah. And, 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 and that was kind of my next thought. And, and this is true, not just with patents, but pretty much everything, copyrights, trademarks. If you come up with it, and, and a company hired you to do that, then it's gonna be owned by the company. Now, what's interesting is I wrote the textbook for this class. Um, and when I wrote it, I was using my BYU-Idaho laptop, which I'm using right now. I was using, I was in my office using library resources from the BYU-Idaho library. Like, like you see where I'm going. I, I, I wrote that textbook basically on BYU-Idaho's dime. Now, that's not entirely true. I spent a lot of extra time at home, uh, time that I didn't have to be doing it. I, I, I kind of did it on my own. It wasn't expected. It wasn't a term of my employment. And so it's, it's a little gray, like, do I own the copyright to that book or does the school? And the school has basically said, look, if, if, if you did it, even on our time, we'll let you keep the copyright will let you keep the intellectual property, but you have to give it to students for free. And that's kind of the, the, the negotiation tactic that BYU-Idaho has used is, is like, look, um, we want you to develop things. We think that's great. It makes you a better teacher. We just don't want you charging students for it. And, and this happened, I don't know, like years ago, I think, a, a teacher wrote a book and then made everybody in the class pay like 300 bucks to get the book that the teacher wrote. You can see that there's a problem there and that the school wouldn't really like that, especially where we are trying to lower the cost of education. And, and, and so, yeah, uh, thanks to that person, I wasn't able to do that. I wanted to charge you all 300 bucks for my textbook masterpiece, but alas, I just gave it to you. For, I'm kidding. I would have given it to you for free anyway. But, um, but, but yeah, th that's a great question. And we'll come back to that as we go through copyright and trademarks and trade secrets, because there is that question of who owns the intellectual property. All right. Uh, so our questions. Yeah. Uh, so isn't this uh, make... Chung, you gotta, you gotta ask the question, man, or I'm gonna cut you off. <laughs> okay, okay, very quick. So I feel like uh, if you don't, if you don't make the textbook free for everyone, the the teacher is gonna roll some like great stuff. If if you force like the stu the teacher like make it free for students, then then the stu then teacher either don't they don't do it, or they roll rubbish. <laughs> so. All right, so that's a good discussion about incentives. But just know that I wrote an amazing textbook and I still gave it away for free. You're welcome. <laughs> for the hells? Yeah. So I actually know of a college that does this back in California where like a teacher wrote the book and then made it mandatory that the class had to purchase it. Yes. Is there any way like that's illegal because he's monopolizing his class to buy his product? No, um, this is largely accepted. And as long as it isn't considered like price gouging. That, that's, that's the real thing to look out for. But if, if the other similar textbooks are also 300 bucks, then it's gonna be permitted. And again, I had to do this all through law school. Every teacher that I had wrote the textbook for torts or criminal law or whatever it was that I was taking, I had to buy my dang teacher's textbook and it's fine as, as long as it isn't overly like, like like i said price gouging um i just wouldn't do it like i i just think that's tacky so all right um okay so here is an interesting thing that has changed like i was just in law school 10 years ago but this has changed since i got out of law school 
So I was always taught that if you invent something, then you get patent protection from the time you invented it, not when you filed it. So you could invent something, sit and wait while you perfect it or whatever. And then when you file for the patent, you could say, I'm filing, it, filing the patent in 2020, but I invented it in 2015. And then you got the patent from 2015 forward. Okay. And, and that's how it always was. Now, and, and invariably, somebody in 2018 or something came up with the same idea, patented it, and then it would get invalidated because somebody two years later would say, sorry, bud, I invented it three years before you. And here's my proof. You, you still have to prove it. You can't just say you did it. But, but you prove that you did it in 2015. And then that would invalidate somebody's 2018 patent. All right. Basically, what happened is the European Union said, hey, America, knock that off. That's a stupid rule. And, and we listened and said, yeah, that is kind of dumb. And so we stopped it. So like, I think this was like seven years ago, we changed it. So now to get patent protection, you have to file first. You can't just sit and wait for five years to file or six years or eight years or whatever. You have to actually file and then you get your patent and then you can use it going forward. The, the, the incentive here is like, hey, if you've invented something cool, patented, patent it, like get it in the, in the patent registry. Um, don't sit around and wait. And so anyway, um, that's what's important here is who files first, not who invented first. All right. Um, okay. Really helps. Yeah. Is the process typically pretty long to get approved for a patent? Yeah, I think, well, it, it, it depends. I think the average time is something like three to six months, but some patents take years and years and and the ones that take years are because they're trying to figure out if it really is novel and they're arguing with the uspto office about some other patent filed three years earlier that's similar but not the same and and that can take a long time that's why sometimes you'll see things on a, a new you know like a, a a brush for your i think this is the last one that i saw was a brush for your grill and you look underneath and it says patent pending it just means basically that they filed a patent, they just haven't received it yet. And it, like I said, sometimes it can take years. Um, all right, so this case here at the bottom, the Inri Imes 2015 case, this is a really interesting one. Um, and, and what happened is this man named Kevin Imes, he filed a patent application for a device, basically an SD card that can send the pictures that you take on the camera. So imagine like, you know, you've got your big Canon DLSR and you're taking pictures, but the SD card that the images are getting sent to is wirelessly sending those images to a camera or sorry, to a computer or to somebody's phone, et cetera. It's a wireless camera. You, you, you've seen these have been around for 10 years. Um, so we filed for that patent a long time, much before 2015. It just got to the courts in 2015. But it went to the USPTO, and the USPTO said, took a very literal uh, um, approach to this. They said, the, the patent officer that got it said, this isn't new. He's like, this isn't new at all. It's a wire, like a wireless SD card. He's like, that's not new because I already have one of those. He's like, when I take pictures with my Canon, I take my SD card out of the, <laughs> of my, sorry, I'm already laughing about it. I take my SD card out of my camera and I stick it into my computer without any wires. So a wireless SD card already exists. Do you see how dumb this is? Anyway, <laughs> so because this patent officer didn't know what he was talking about, the Mr. Imes, so Kevin Imes had to sue the USPTO or kind of sue it, basically challenge their determination that it wasn't novel and it had to go up to the courts who eventually said, yeah, this is novel, like silly lower person that said it wasn't. Like there's a big difference between taking an SD card out and putting it in, in your computer without wires and it just automatically sending to your computer. So Kevin Imes was eventually, you know, happy story. 
he got his patent and was able to profit off of his wireless SD card that everybody knew was, it just, this is a great story to show you that they screw things up and they don't get it sometimes. Now to work at the USPTO and to be a patent attorney often, you have to have a background, an undergrad in a science degree, typically engineering is kind of the main one, but biology, a, a lot of the other degrees are important. Um, and, and if you're interested in this, uh, you can make lots of money. So I have a friend that is a patent attorney in Southern California. He's he's doing all right, let's just say. So um, anyway, but, but I love telling that story because it just shows that they can get it wrong and stretch the time out. Like normally it should have been a three month process to get this patent, but it took like seven years. So that, that that's kind of where we are. Um, these are some interesting patents that I found, a retractable iPhone screen protector, a golf ball tracking glasses. So if I, if I click on this one, um, this is it. These are just glasses that will always track your, um, wh wherever your golf ball is. It'll, it's like Iron Man glasses or something. It'll just be like, oh, they're over there and the distance is this far. And anyway, that's the patent for this. Um, that was, uh, let's see, what year was this? 2014. So we're coming up on six years back. Uh, they came up with those things. So I don't know. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, okay. And then the last thing that I like to talk about is just patent infringement. So again, there's no rule. Don't listen to suits for that one episode. There's no like 33% overlap or whatever that you have to watch for. It's just, did you infringe on somebody else's patent? Um, is it is it substantially infringing? That, that, that's all that really matters. Um, so uh, again, that's, uh, if you find that somebody else is using your patent, well, you sue them for patent infringement and you get money, a percentage of whatever it is that they've been selling. Like, like if, if somebody else steals my, my idea for glasses, uh, golf ball tracking glasses, and they steal that technology, um, but they call it you know, like, like, uh, just something else. Well, I sue them and I say, look, you stole my patent and I'm entitled to 80% of whatever, it, of, of all of your profits or revenue, like that's all up for grabs. And, and I sue them for that and then I'll probably win. Now, the issue here is something that I call, well, not that I call, that everybody calls patent trolls. Now, ignore this Disney sign. We'll talk about Disney later. But patent trolls are interesting, and you read that article about them because you can buy somebody else's patent. Like, I may find that somebody, that person that wrote the golf ball tracking glasses, I really like it. And so I go buy it. And once I buy that patent from somebody else, then I own that patent. And if it's got 10 years left, well, I've got 10 years to enforce that patent. And if I know of other companies that are infringing on that patent, then I'm going to start suing them because I bought the patent and I'm going to sue them. And that, all of that is totally legal and completely ethical. The story that you read about was legal, but not ethical because you could get, there are so many patents. There's so many patents. You could find a patent for like wireless charging, you know, electric conducting or, or whatever. And something that's got a year left and buy that and then just sue everybody that came out with an electric charger. Whether they use the same technology or not, patent trolls don't care. They just sue everybody and they send scary letters that say, send us a million dollars or we're going to sue you for 60 million. And lots of times companies just settle because they're like, well, if we fought this in court, it's going to cost more than a million bucks. Um, let's just pay them a million dollars right now. And that's how some patent trolls make a lot of money. Now, again, this class is turning into like how to make you little criminals and unethical people. So some of you are like, I'm going to go buy a couple patents for a buck and then I'm going to start suing people for a million dollars and then I'm going to retire. Don't, don't do that. But, but if you do, don't forget to buy the house in Florida. Just kidding. Don't, don't do any of this stuff. Um, uh, because again, if, if, if it's done in bad faith, meaning you don't really know if they're infringing, but you're going to sue anyway to find out. Yeah, that's, that's just not the way to live your life. So, um, and patent trolls have largely been pushed down lately simply because more and more companies are saying, 
you know, they're, they're not going to take it anymore. Like, yeah, let's fight this. Let's go to court. And then, and sometimes you can get attorney's fees. If you can discover that they did it in bad faith, that you were sued in bad faith, um, then you can get attorney's fees. And that's kind of reduced the amount of patent trolls that, that, that we have lately. So yeah, that's, that's the material for today for patents. Um, does anybody have any questions before we jump out of here? I have a quick question. Yeah. So Ed, I watch a lot of YouTube and a common complaint from YouTubers is abuse of like copyright laws. Mm -hmm. So if you make a video singing a song, yeah. then the record label or whatever company can come after you and claim the revenue from that video. Uh -huh. um, is that actually abuse of the law? Uh, because it isn't, aren't there like fair rights or fair, fair use rights that, um, that you can use like if you transform the material and whatnot? Yes, yeah. So as long as you transform the material by 16.3%, I'm kidding, all right, all right. Just had to do that. But um, yeah, if, yes. So this is basically Wednesday's lesson. So. Um, but I'll just give you a little push in this direction. Um, the artist formerly known as Prince, but then came back to being known as Prince. He was aggressive with this before he, he passed away a couple years ago. Um, there was this, a, a video of a little kid just dancing to Prince. Um, one of Prince's songs, the, the mom put it up on YouTube and Prince found it got on online with his attorney. The attorney contacted this family and said, get that thing off the internet. And they had to because that, that was copyright infringement. It, it was playing Prince's song in the background. Now, now, copyright is very different than patent law because where, where we've kept patent law just limited to 20 years, you'll see when you get to the reading, copyright law just kind of keeps <laughs> absurdly expanding. And so lots of people are concerned about that. And, uh, and fair use is what you were talking about, that this is kind of the defense to copyright infringement um, has been expanded somewhat. And so oftentimes, if, if you substantially changed it um, or it's a parody or that, that there's a number of things that you'll read about under fair use, then sometimes it isn't considered copyright infringement anymore. So, well still technically infringement but your defense is fair use so that that's a good teaser for for wednesday's lesson so yeah that, that's a good question